Well, we are, are in a sermon series called Mountain Peaks of Old Testament Revelation. And so far, we have touched on creation. We've looked at the Abrahamic covenant and the Passover. <clears throat> this is a little different from what we usually do here <clears throat> because this is more of an overview, just hitting the highlights. But sometimes that is a needed perspective. Sometimes we need to see the bigger picture of how God's redemptive plan of unfolds in history. And the best way to do that is to hit the main points along the way. And that's exactly what we're doing in this series. Now, as I have pointed out, the Old Testament is often more difficult to preach than the New Testament. This is true for several reasons. One, <clears throat> because it was written in Hebrew and Aramaic instead of Greek, which is a more difficult language. Two, it is even further removed as far as culture and customs are concerned. And for this reason, many consider it foreign or irrelevant. Third, since most of the Old Testament books are much longer than the New Testament books, simply the sheer volume of it is somewhat intimidating. And fourth, there are long sections of it that appear to be dealing with things that only the ancient Jews could benefit from, such as genealogies, detailed laws, plans for the tabernacle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as Rick Holland has said, the biggest problem with the preaching of the Old Testament in evangelical pulpits today is the perception that there is no relevance or authority for Christians in modern times. We must not buy into that uh, false understanding. As early as 1955, Emil Kraling warned, <clears throat> the Old Testament problem is not just one of many. It is the master problem of theology. And I believe that is true because a neglect of the Old Testament or a misuse of the Old Testament has created more divergence in theological understanding than perhaps anything else. And as I have said, <clears throat> it's very important for us to understand the whole counsel of God. Without the Old Testament, there are many truths that we could not fully understand in the New Testament. The basis for all Christian theology is found in the Old Testament scriptures. That was the Bible of the early Christians. It is the Old Testament of which Paul said, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. In fact, as Walter Kaiser writes, the designation Old Testament is in itself anachronistic, for nowhere in the first 39 books of the Bible does this term occur. Actually, it was the Alexandrian church father, Origen, who gave us this nomenclature based in part on God's promise in Jeremiah 31, 31 of a new covenant, hence his New Testament designation. And so he designated the Old Testament and the New Testament all came from origin. <clears throat> but Kaiser says both the label and the translation are misleading. It is only ecclesiastical convention that dictates our continued use of this term for that group of biblical books that the Jews referred to as the writings, the scripture, and the law and the prophets. 
The whole point is that the early Christians did not consider the Old Testament Scripture to be any less God's Word than the New Testament. However, the problem of the Old Testament did emerge in the New Testament church. Right in the book of Acts, we see where the believers from Antioch were confused about how the Old Testament Scripture fit in with the message of the gospel. And in Acts 15.1 we read, And some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And these men were, of course, the Judaizers. And they took a certain position on how the Old Testament law was supposed to fit in with the New Testament gospel. Unfortunately, their position was not the right one. And the church had to settle this question under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's what the church council in Acts 15 is about. But the point here is that they were wrestling with this whole issue of how the Mosaic law fits with the message of the gospel of grace. And you know what? People are still wrestling with that today. In fact, one of the reasons why we have so many denominations is because people have come to different conclusions on this issue. How does the Mosaic Covenant fit with the New Testament gospel? That's the question. Now, I was intending to go to Exodus chapter 20 this evening and deal with the Ten Commandments. But I think we're going to have to wait one more week for that because we really need to lay a foundation before we do that. You see, the Ten Commandments are really part of something bigger. They're part of what is called the Mosaic Covenant. <clears throat> and what is summarized in the Ten Commandments is expounded upon in the rest of the delineation of the Old Testament law. And I have decided that what we really need to do this evening is to give kind of a big introduction to the Mosaic Covenant. This is not going to be a normal sermon. But I believe it is critical for us to understand some very important issues related to how the law fits with the gospel. This has caused so many problems and so much division in the church down through the centuries. And I can tell, tell you, it has caused people to leave this body of believers. In addition to the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, which dealt with the Judaizers, there was the emergence of Marcion in the second century. And we already looked at this, but Marcion taught that the God of the Old Testament was different from the God of the New Testament. So he rejected not only the Old Testament in its entirety, but also any reference to the Old Testament that was found in the New Testament. That teaching was labeled heresy by the early church, but as I said, it still has its proponents today. And then, during the days of the Reformation, there was what is called Neo-Lutheranism. We're all greatly indebted to Martin Luther for awakening the church to the true gospel of sola fide by faith alone. Really, Luther's position was that salvation was by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And you hear me give that statement many, many times. It is that little word sola, alone, for which many of the reformers gave their lives. And we strongly affirm that here at Parker Bible Church because that is the biblical gospel in contrast to the faith and works mix of the Catholic concept. But the problem was that 
Luther was so strongly against Roman Catholic understanding of the gospel that he began to equate their approach to salvation with the Old Testament law. And so as a result, many of the early Protestants developed a great disdain against the Old Testament. And this is often the case today. There are people still today, especially those of of the Reformed tradition, that reject any emphasis on the Old Testament. Then there is what is known as theonomy, and that's kind of the other extreme. It has become popular in many circles today, especially uh, Christians who are involved in the political arena. Radical theonomy is the idea that God's governmental rule in the Old Testament law is intended to remain the blueprint for reforming the world today. For theonomists, the concept of continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament becomes the guiding principle for interpreting the Bible. And in these churches, the preaching of the Old Testament law is primary. If you go in one of these churches, that's what you're going to hear. Constantly you're going to hear the teaching of the Old Testament law. It is the Old Testament law that is believed to be the secret to revival and reformation, not only here in the U.S., but around the world. Now, the exact opposite of this is also a problem. That is extreme dispensationalism. Extreme dispensationalists divide history into divisions, And for them, discontinuity becomes the hermeneutical key. And what happens for extreme dispensationalists is that the Old Testament law becomes relegated to the age of law, and the New Testament is then seen as the age of grace. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem is, according to Scripture, there is grace in the Old Testament period, and there is law in the New Testament period. You just can't neatly categorize things like this. And just so you know, we here at Parker Bible Church are mildly dispensational. That, I don't know if that's our official position, but I think that's probably where we fit. In our doctrinal statement, We explain that we are dispensational to the extent that we see a clear distinction between Israel and the church, and we believe in a literal 1,000-year millennial kingdom. So, at least to that degree, it makes us dispensationalists. But you're probably already wondering about tonight's sermon. In fact, you may still be wondering at the end of it, because we're not even going to get to a specific text tonight. All of this really is introductory for examining Exodus 20. When we get to it, it's going to be a couple of weeks now, but you'll need to promise me you're going to be here for that. And the reason we're doing this is because the issue of the Old Testament law is such a difficult one and has created so many problems in the church down through history, and it is still very much misunderstood today. So we're going to spend some extra time tonight on this important matter of the Old Testament law and how the Mosaic Covenant fits in with the gospel of grace. And the first thing we need to understand is what the Bible refers to as the Torah. The Hebrew word Torah and the word for law are not necessarily synonyms. While not all Torah is law, all law is Torah. In other words, Torah is the broader term, law is the narrower term. 
But the term Torah essentially means instruction. It's used over 220 times in the Old Testament. It's found most often in the Psalms, especially Psalm 119 that we just read a little bit of, and in the book of Deuteronomy. It has to do with God's divine standard for his people. Sometimes it describes ceremonial regulations, such as sacrifices, offerings, Sabbaths, feasts, temple worship, clean and unclean regulations, and prohibitions against idolatry. Other times, it refers to civil or judicial matters, such as how to settle disputes or other life issues. Sometimes, it's referred to uh, broadly for the entire book of Deuteronomy, where the bulk of the Old Testament law is delineated. It's referred to as law, the book of the law, the book of the law of Moses, the law of Moses, the book of the law of God, and the law of the Lord. Sometimes <clears throat> it's used even more broadly than that as it refers to the entire Pentateuch, <coughs> the first, four, first five books of the Bible of the Old Testament which was written by Moses. Sometimes it even includes the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, speaking of any instruction for godly living. In its broadest application, it is any instruction that God gives to his people. The Torah is also referred to by a number of other terms in Scripture sometimes mentioned by the word for judgments. That word occur, occurs 425 times in the Old Testament and has clear judicial connotations. It has to do with settling some kind of dispute. And there are all kinds of instructions given in the Old Testament with the government of the nation of Israel, laws that were civil laws. For example, the book of the covenant, which is Exodus 21 through 23, is filled with commands from God for the regulation of Israelite civil cases. In fact, there are four primary blocks of material in the Old Testament that deal primarily with law codes. They are, of course, the Ten Commandments, but also the book of the covenant, Exodus 21 through 23, the holiness code, Leviticus 17 through 25, and the stipulations of Deuteronomy chapter 12 through chapter 26. These four blocks of legal codes, if you will, in the Old Testament. The legal codes of the, New, of the Old Testament are generally divided into two types. The apodictic law, which is primarily the Ten Commandments, and the casuistic law or case law. And the main difference between the two is that case law is in the form of if this happens, you do this, where the, whereas the apodic, apodictic law is in the form of you shall or you shall not. Casuistic law is usually in third person, is governed by a specific situation, often contains long explanatory comments, and usually identifies the consequences for failing to comply. Apodictic law is usually in the second person, gives a statement of principle, commands without comment, and doesn't usually, usually state the consequences. Now, I'll give you an example of both. Turn with me for a moment to Deuteronomy 15. Deuteronomy 15. <clears throat> Here's an example of case law. Deuteronomy 15, verses 7 and 8. 
If there is a poor man with you, one of your brothers in any of your towns in your land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart <clears throat> nor close your hand from your poor brother, but you shall freely open your hand to him and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need in whatever he lacks. So this is a case where uh, if there's this situation, this is what you're commanded to do. An example of apodictic law is Exodus 20 and verse 3. You don't have to turn there, but it simply says, you shall have no other gods before me. Another word that is used often is the word ordinances, which occurs 229 times in the Old Testament. This had to do with something that is permanently preserved. There's an ordinance, and this is a permanent thing. Then there's the word stipulations. It is connected with the concept of covenant or testimony. And this term emphasizes that the law is the seal of the Lord's covenant with Israel. Two other terms are important. There is the word commandments, which is found 181 times in the Old Testament. And there's the, the term words, which serves as a technical reference to the Ten Commandments. All of this is part of the Jewish understanding of the law. Now, there's an aspect of this that is often missed by people of our day and time. And that is that the general attitude toward the Torah <clears throat> in the Old Testament was positive. It was positive. The writers of the Old Testament usually held the Old Testament law in a very positive light. And you know, a lot of people today want to get rid of the Ten Commandments because they're perceived as something very negative. People today do not want God telling them what to do or not to do. But the law was really seen in the Old Testament as something very good. It was God's way of leading his people to the most abundant life. For example, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Psalm 119, 77 says, May thy compassion come to me that I may live, for thy law is my delight. And we could go to many, many other similar passages. <clears throat> but the law was seen as a source of delight, devotion, wonder, grace, something precious, true, and something to be loved. And the reason why it was seen in such positive light is because it was understood by Israel to be in the context of covenants. It was part of Israel's unique relationship with God. And any time that <clears throat> the Old Testament seems to be presenting the law in some kind of negative way, it is usually because it is addressing an abuse of the law such as external-only ritualism. But let's get down to some key elements in a biblical understanding of Mosaic or Old Testament law. There are several things that we need to keep in mind as we think about how the law fits in with the gospel. <clears throat> First of all, we need to understand that Moses never perceived that obedience to the Old Testament law was a precondition to salvation. But as a grateful response to God's mercy and grace. In Exodus 20, verse 2, we have the preamble 
to the Ten Commandments. And here, God tells why he's giving his law. And he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. In other words, it is in response to that specific salvation, the redemption from Egypt, that God is calling them to live under his law. In Exodus 19, 5 and 6, God is giving the rationale for establishing the Mosaic Covenant with Israel. And there he says, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Moses did not perceive of the keeping of the law as something imposed by one party on another. No, he saw it as the expression of a covenant entered into by both parties. It's also important to keep in mind that the Israelites saw the law as something which was a precondition for the blessing of God. If they obeyed God, they would be blessed, and if not, they would be cursed. And they did not see it as something that was unattainable. They saw it as something that could be obeyed, although not perfectly. But God had provided means for atonement and forgiveness when they failed to keep it perfectly. And the law was something that was seen as that which would separate them from the other nations of the world who worshiped gods of stone and wood instead of the true and living God. So with all that background, let's go to the $64 question. Are New Testament believers required to live in accordance with some or all of the Mosaic law? Do the Ten Commandments apply to Christians today? And if so, in what way? That's what we want to know. And there are essentially five positions on this. Just like everything else, we have to develop our own little position on it theologically. There are five positions on this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these tonight, but I at least want you to know what they are. I want you to know this, first of all, because I want you to understand that this has been a very difficult issue historically in the church. And there is still today not total, total agreement on it. And I want you to know this also because As we approach the Ten Commandments next time, I want you to understand that the simplistic way which many people look at the Ten Commandments is not necessarily a biblical perspective. And this whole debate revolves around the question of continuity or discontinuity. You've heard me talk about that before. Does the Mosaic law continue in the New Testament era or not? Does the Mosaic law continue into the New Testament era or not? Now, of the five alternatives, two of them lean toward continuity and two of them lean toward discontinuity and the other one tries to balance the two. First of all, leaning toward continuity, there is the theonomic reformed approach. And according to one theonomist, theonomy wishes to see every nation conform its civil practices to those revealed in the Mosaic legislation. In other words, he says, theonomy does not wish to return to a biblical ethic 
or a Judeo-Christian ethic, but to the ethic of the Sinai Covenant. It's interesting to note that about the theonomists. And people who hold this view today assume that the Old Testament laws continue to be morally binding unless they are specifically rescinded or modified by further revelation. So these people believe that the Old Testament laws provide the divine standard by which all nations should live. And their goal is to accomplish that through three steps, what they call regeneration, re-education, and gradual legal reform. They, they want to bring all the nations of the world back under the Mosaic law. A second view, also leaning toward continuity, is the Reformed approach. Reformed theologians or covenant theologians boil everything down to two covenant concepts, the covenant of law and the covenant of grace. You've probably heard that. Now, these are not biblical covenants like the Abrahamic or Davidic covenants, but are covenant concepts upon which they hang all the teaching of Scripture. This is the grid they see everything through. And without going into too much detail, they essentially believe that the Mosaic law is divided into three realms, the moral law, the ceremonial law, and the civil law. They believe that the moral law is summarized in the Ten Commandments. The ceremonial laws had to do with things such as sacrifices, the priestly system, etc., and have been abrogated with the coming of Christ. And the judicial laws have to do with specific case laws for governing, governing Israel, and they also have been done away with because of Christ. The third view, leaning toward discontinuity, is the modified Lutheran approach. Lutheran theology has generally emphasized a great contrast between the law and the gospel. And those who hold this view believe that the entire Mosaic law has now been done away with because of Christ. They generally reject a threefold division of the law, but they say that the moral content of the Mosaic law is applicable to New Testament believers when it is clearly repeated in the New Testament. Now, I, I hope you're tracking with this. You may be thinking, okay, now where do I fit here? Then, fourthly, also leaning toward discontinuity is the dispensational approach. And this view holds that the Mosaic law never had any ability to bring about salvation, but instead was given for a fourfold purpose. As a demonstration of God's graciousness, as a provision for approaching God, as a provision for worship, and as a means of governing Israel. The emphasis is placed on verse, verses like Galatians 3.24 and the fact that Paul spoke of the law as a tutor to bring us to Christ. As Matthew 5.17-19 through 19 says, Christ does not abolish the law but fulfills it. And as Romans 10.4 says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, there's a fifth view that attempts to balance continuity and discontinuity. And the primary proponent of this view is Walter Kaiser. He acknowledges a nat national future for Israel, but he sees some points of continuity between 
the Old Testament and the New Testament that many dispensationalists would reject. Kaiser says that Christ is the goal or purposeful conclusion of the Mosaic law. In other words, he's saying the same things that Paul said, that the law points the sinner to Christ. He does accept the threefold division of the law, moral, ceremonial, and civil. And he says that the weightier matters of the law, Matthew 23, 23, are the moral aspects which the Lord sets above the ceremonial and the civil aspects. He says that when the new covenant promises to place God's law in the heart of those who participate in that covenant, that it is the Mosaic law in particular that is placed in the heart. Jeremiah 31, 33. You say, preacher, what's your view? Well, I don't know where I fit on the scale. But I believe there is both continuity and discontinuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I also believe it is valid to divide the Mosaic law into three categories and to recognize that the civil and ceremonial aspects had to do with the nation of Israel in the Old Testament and are no longer in force for New Testament believers. I do believe that the moral aspects of the Mosaic law still apply because they're based on the character of God. <clears throat> but all of the Ten Commandments are restated in the New Testament except for the keeping of the Sabbath. I do believe that the primary purpose for the law is to show man his sin and therefore his need for the Savior. I don't believe that the law was ever given as a means of salvation, as a divine torture chamber just to make men miserable, or as a way of earning brownie points in heaven, in other words, legalism. I don't believe the law was for any of those purposes. The law was a revelation of the holy, righteous character of God and in contrast to show man his sinfulness. But the Mosaic covenant is the old covenant of the book of Hebrews that was replaced by the new covenant as we've been looking at and seeing very clearly in 2 Corinthians. According to Galatians 2.16, a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Galatians 3, through 26 says, The scripture has shut up all men under sin, <clears throat> that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Doug Moo says the entire Mosaic law comes to fulfillment in Christ. And this fulfillment means that this law is no longer a direct and immediate source of or judge of the conduct of God's people. Christian behavior, rather, is now guided by the law of Christ. Well, this has just been a big introduction tonight. No points on the outline, none of that. But I hope it's 
laying some foundation that I think we'll need when we come back next time in three weeks, I think, whenever that is, the 13th maybe of September, and we look at Exodus chapter 20 and the Ten Commandments. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for your instruction. We thank you for your word, all of it, what is known as the Old Testament and the New Testament. We know it's all inspired of you. So, Lord, we ask for your wisdom, and we ask that you would enable us and help us to rightly understand the principles you've given us in your word and how all these things fit together. And I know this has been very confusing to so many people and still is today. But Lord, we pray that we would have your perspective, that we'd have a biblical understanding of how these things work together, these covenants. And Lord, uh, help us to stick with the truth of your word and not with just systems of theology. So Lord, help us to be grounded in you and your truth again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.